Okay, well, welcome everybody um, to our second play date of the semester. We've already made it through a couple weeks, which is unbelievable. They went by really quickly. Um, so I'm going to not spend much time here. I'm Ben Knapp, Director of the Institute for Creativity, Arts, and Technology here, and you're in the cube right now, or you're online seeing us in the cube. Um, and so I'm, today's talk is on civility, arts, and technology, um, creativity, arts, and technology to build civility. And with that, you can see why I'm going to pass it right over to Phyllis Newbel, um, who's a, our associate director within our Center for Educational Networks and Impacts, to introduce our guest. So Phyllis. Thank you, Ben. Welcome, everybody. So glad you're here this morning. It is a gorgeous Friday morning in Blacksburg, so hey to everybody who's online. Um, I am pleased this morning to uh, welcome uh, Courtney Sermonek and Dr. Todd Shank. Uh, Courtney is an instructor for, with the Center for Communicating Science in the School of Performing Arts uh, and is also working toward a graduate degree at Virginia Tech. And uh, Todd is uh, a faculty in the School of Public and International Affairs. And they've done some really great work and going to share some nascent work. Uh, so we're, as you're thinking through, um, thinking about what you're hearing today, think about your feedback and think about how things can move forward and they'll tell you more about that. Um, and also, if you're online, if you have questions for us, uh, please put those into the questions uh, link so we can get those to the presenters uh, as we finish up, as they finish up their, their part of the presentation. And also re remember that if you're here in the space, we do have a 360 camera so everybody can see everything you're doing. So even if you're behind the camera, still don't pick your nose. Okay, and keep your masks on anyway. All right, so I'm going to, with that, <laughs> uh, I will turn it over to Courtney and Todd. Great. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Now I'm going to be here the whole time. Don't pick nose, don't pick nose. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Phyllis, Ben, the crew here. It's really wonderful to have a chance to be with you. And as Phyllis said, I'm glad you said it, that we have some nascent work we're going to share. Phyllis asked us uh, beforehand, um, are there any questions you know that you might want to have? And I was like, no, we want to ask everybody here questions. We want to get your feedback on uh, what we're talking about and what we're proposing. So we're excited about it, but um, as you'll see, it's, it's uh, at least what we want to focus on this morning is somewhat nascent. So um, we should point out before we uh, start rolling here that we have a couple other team members that unfortunately couldn't be here today. Bob Leonard, I'm sure many of you know, uh, in performing arts uh, is one of those members. And we're really lucky to have Diksha uh, Pal Palania did I pronounce it correctly? I hope. Diksha just joined the team last week, so I'm, you have to excuse my uh, mispronunciation of her last name, probably. And we're really happy to have Diksha join us. Uh, and as you'll see, she's already um, helping us think how to, about how to move this along. And so we're very lucky to have her. So um, what is the goal of our project? Well, what we've been trying to do is find ways to integrate the arts, technology, and best practices in um, building empathy and uh, dialogue across difference um, as a way to um, promote more civil discourse. And so bringing those things together, using the arts and technology to, to enhance or, or um, push forward these ideas of civility. Uh, what have we done so far on the project? Well, we actually started an ICAT grant last year, uh, and we uh, did a production Courtney's going to speak about in a moment here called The Race. Uh, we uh, started our website platform. We have that up. Um, and we ran a series of workshops, and we'll touch upon each of those very briefly. Um, this year, ICAT was kind enough, uh, thank you again, uh, to uh, extend, we did, weren't able to use all the funding we had last year because of COVID restrictions and things we couldn't do that we wanted to do. So they kindly allowed us to, to carry some of that money over for this year. Um, and so we have a new concept we want to get your feedback on, we're going to focus on uh, today or this morning, uh, called Conversation Cubed. Um, and then in addition to that, we want to do some more work with our website um, and with our workshops. But as I say, we really want to focus this morning um, on um, the Conversation Cubed idea. So with that, I'll talk just a little bit about the race. Uh, the race encompassed a very big team, and there are two members of the team in the room, which is exciting. So hi, Rachel Potter Nunn, and hi, Susie Young. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the race is a play that offered a score, which was adaptable. And we utilized the score to present a production at the advent of the 2020 election. Um, the play explores communication, uh, empathy, what makes uh, equitable, successful leadership? How do we communicate with one another in more empathetic ways? 
And yeah, the team was really, really large. This is a picture of uh, us in the cube attempting to figure out how to bring actors together in an online space uh, in a way that, yeah, you can actually flip to the next image because I think it'll show where we were, which was uh, Zoom, sadly. Uh, but having a lot of fun, as you can see, in our own physical spaces. You can see Rachel at the bottom right. Um, and thankfully, we went from here to, and you can move to the next slide, here, uh, experimenting. And this is Rachel Weiss at the bottom left. She's utilizing a platform called Live Lab that I actually want to get the definition for. Well, it's a it's a peer to peer platform which was is open source and built for performers and theater makers to utilize. Uh, very experimental, and they actually released the platform, I think, six months before they were ready to because of the pandemic. And it allows for actors coming from uh, various outputs to actually be in virtual space with one another. And you might know that Zoom now offers or is trying to offer something very similar, I actually just used it last week, um, Immersive View. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> uh, I can attest to this. Uh, created this really beautiful production that completely failed as soon as there were audience members. Uh, and I'll, we can move to the next slide. So this is uh, the kind of dream uh, map that David wonderfully created for us. The idea was that we were having an intentional audience with us on Zoom that we had done workshops with, a civility workshop, exploring concepts of civility and how we communicate with one another, um, a public audience on YouTube. Uh, we were thinking about using Mozilla Hubs and a platform called Future Stages, which is an immersive platform that allows for uh, audience members to be in a theater space as avatars. It didn't work out. Um, we utilized OBS Studio to bring everything together and of course Live Lab, which I explained before. And I say this was our dream because it didn't work. And I think that's something really exciting about the creative exploration we did over the course of several months with the really amazing support of Tanner, David, uh, George Hardbeck, who is not with us at ICAT anymore, uh, spent a lot of time and labor with us exploring different possibilities, being open to the possibility of failure and yeah, we couldn't have done that without them. And we've learned so much from this process that will filter into this next event that we hope to do. So you can shift to the next slide. Uh, yeah, this is just a, a view of kind of what was happening. That's me in the corner with my arms up because I was very excited. Uh, Taylor Wood sharing audience output to one of our actors whose name is Jake. Um, he was receiving feedback on ways to be a, a good leader and ways to improve the content of a speech that he was giving. And it was a very funny experience. You can move to the next slide. Yes, and so this is what the audience was seeing during that time. And you can move to the next slide. And that's Rachel. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is Icebreaker. It's a platform that we hoped to use throughout the course of the production, uh, actually bringing in audience members to have conversations with one another. And the whole point of this Icebreaker platform is to make conversations fun and intimate online. It didn't end up working out. Uh, in the course of the production, but we did use it as a post-show Q&A conversation platform, and I think it worked really well for that. And I keep saying, we wanted to do this, but it didn't happen. We wanted to do this, but it didn't work. Uh, and I hope I'm kind of seeding ideas to you all because you might have concepts or technology platforms in your mind that we should utilize for our next event. You can go to the next slide. And this is just another view of another scene. Uh, we had ASL interpretation, which felt really exciting and important. It was also another kind of beautiful challenge to figure out, and Susie spent a lot of time on that problem. Yes. All right, so building off of those experiences, all the learning that happened with the race, um, we, our uh, 
proposing as a next step here for this year um, is what we're calling Conversation Cubed. And really where this comes from is this idea or notion that um, conversations are neither purely about fact, that is they're not purely about information, technical information or otherwise, nor should they arguably be purely about emotion. They're about this ways in which emotion, feeling, perspectives, values, um, and information intertwine. And so um, recognizing the three-dimensional nature of good conversation, um, what we'd like to do is find ways that we can use um, all of the uh, power that we have at ICAT here in this room and, and so on um, to um, integrate, essentially, as you can see, uh, lived experience, the way people network with each other, emotions, intuition, um, information, and evidence, uh, values and ethics, and so on, into richer conversations. And what does that look like? What we'd like to do is um, have something that looks like this, where we um, have some principles that are involved in a conversation um, with one another, but that is supplemented in rich ways um, by an active audience uh, that is engaged in those conversations with them, um, with the help of some facilitation, and also importantly with the help of what we're calling data sleuths. And you might say, what the heck is a data sleuth? So a data sleuth is essentially a, a small team of folks that are there to help mine information that might help push the conversation along might help to make the conversation a little bit richer. And yes, not everybody has to accept all of those quote unquote facts. Um, people can accept them or not, but at the very least there's new information fed into the conversation as it unfolds. And we imagine all of that happening within the cube, this cube, um, but also of course for the, the opportunities for the wider world to engage, just much like today. We have this YouTube live stream uh, going out and people can feed into it. And we'll get into a moment here into more of the details uh, that Diksha has really been helping us a lot uh, to think about uh, in terms of exactly how this can play out and how we can really uh, make this a much more immersive and multi, not only multi-dimensional, but multi-sensorial experience. And on that note, you're gonna hear Diksha's voice from above. One question that stuck with us was, how often do we get a chance to know the continuous plethora of emotions that an audience is feeling while witnessing the performances? And this is what defined the base of the entire idea of Conversation Cube. The three major inspirations for the design of the space would be using colors to both create and reflect the aura of the room. Second, various avenues for intervention into the conversation. And third, can be implied by changing backgrounds. The major references were game shows like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, where the rooms constantly goes through a change in color depending on the right or wrong answers that you give or meditation channels where you can choose your own kind of background and space and sit in mindfulness the visual elements that might be required if if this idea goes ahead would be a center stage a podium or hot seats or and a half cyclorama or projector screens in the background of the participants and facing the audience and so I'll uh, just walk through a couple of these images quickly. So I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is actually the Indian version, which I didn't even know existed. Pretty cool. But uh, in this show, uh, essentially, as the stakes are upped, the colors change, the you know the sound effects change, we can imagine ways in which we might use color within the room to reflect feedback from the audience, right? Are people agreeing? Um, are they uh, disagreeing with the person speaking, but more or less in consensus? Or are we seeing both stronger feelings and more divergent feelings among the audience, or vice versa? So we can imagine how we can use the colorscape within the room to reflect some of that. Um, and this is something Diksha introduced us as a kind of cool model or example of, of something that uh, was an um, interactive art show um, using, um, I believe it's Van Gogh's work, um, to, uh, to reflect that. But there's different, there are other um, analogs out there in the world we might draw from, things like mood rings um, that might help us to, to think about how we can use color both as a way to reflect but also impact the conversation. So presumably for those at the front of the room, the color, color changes will influence what they're thinking. And of course we would have other ways in which we would in, uh, provide feedback. We would allow for, for example, snippets of text at certain points or we might do straw polls and so on at, at points and have them sort of float around the room. Oops. Um, the back, sense of backgrounds is something new. It's honestly something I hadn't thought about at all. And Diksha introduced us as well as a way, what happens if we are in a half cyclorama like this, for example, and we provide a different background? Particularly one can imagine if, say, the discussion is on, say, an environmental theme, uh, and we could put people in that environment. What kind of implications would that have? And so um, we certainly something we're exploring or thinking about with that. 
think there's supposed to be audio with this, but maybe. So if oh, we, we go. go ahead with this idea, the flow would somehow go like this, wherein participants would walk in and choose the kind of environment that we that they want to have the conversation in. Then the conversation would begin be between the participants. As soon as the conversation begins, the audience can start putting in the inputs of regarding their moods. They can choose certain colors based on how they are feeling or at some moments they can choose green for right or red for wrong. Then all of these inputs would go to an interpreter who would convert all of the data in terms of percentage or graph charts or just visual any kind of visual re representations. We will then take that representation and project it on the bigger screen behind the participant. And after that, the facilitator between the participants can look at the screen and navigate the conversation based on the feedback that he has received from the audience. And throughout this process, our data sleuths can provide fact checks or pointers to take the conversation ahead at any point of time. So this graphic is, oh, it's not working. This anyway. video is just an example of the changing colors. However, we can use any form of visual representation and come up with different ideas as we refine this project. Thank you. So that's all we wanted to say about that idea. And as I say, really, that's the meat of what we wanted to discuss with you today and what we're looking for your feedback on. Um, very, very briefly, we do have a couple of other things um, on the go. Our website, which you can visit there, shameless plug, um, at civility.vt.edu. Um, we managed to get a module up last year, which is a training, but frankly, it's still somewhat crude, especially for those of you that do this kind of tech stuff. Um, and so we look forward to pushing that along a little bit and are always happy to have advice on that. Um, and then our workshops. And so last year we uh, ran um, five different workshops. We had over 300 people participate in. Some of those were in, uh, here at Virginia Tech. Some of those were in places like Patrick County um, and uh, Floyd County. And so um, we certainly hope to, they were all via Zoom, of course, with COVID. So we're looking forward to pushing that along and in particular thinking about um, how we could develop uh, more advanced um, workshops on such things as anti-oppression uh, and or um, the social contract in, uh, in uh, deliberation. So I think that's all we had for you, but uh, we're really keen um, for your questions, but also for your feedback. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Excellent, thank you, um, Todd and Courtney for this, what a great and timely uh, conversation to be having now and, to, and also to be exploring how we can use this technology to keep us all safe and also bring us together, which I think is, um, if there were two goals for this particular moment in history, <laughs> if we can keep us safe and bring us together, I think you all are working on the, the really hard and good work. Um, so, and I love your phrase, the beautiful challenges. So I'm just gonna be stealing that from now on. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you've got questions, I, I'll come out. So just kind of raise your hand and I'll come out so you can, so the folks online will be able to hear you. I'll bring you the mic, I'll hold on to it and you can speak into it. Uh, so if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll find you. Um, and also, I was so excited to, in to introduce you all that I forgot to mention that we have an announcement this morning, which is um, you all mentioned that you got ICAT seed money in order to do this project. There are ICAT seed grants uh, for students. Uh, they're due October 8th. There are five grants. This, this is the Roger and Debbie West student seed grants. There are five grants for $1,000 each. So if you are a student, uh, working with someone from another college, uh, so you need to be cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary. Um, that information is on our website, and you can talk with any of the ICAT folks here if you have questions about that as well. Okay, also be sure to sign the sheet that's going around. Uh, we use that to, to uh, make sure that we can buy more donuts, so it's very important. <laughs> All right, uh, so what questions do we have in the audience? And I've got a few coming in online, but I'll start with who's in the room. What thoughts do you have? Y'all think on that, I'll do the one online. All right, can you talk about um, the research on the uh, pros and cons of technology and civil discourse? When does technology make things happen, like the race, and when do things have to be face-to-face -face and are there ways to do both? That was a lot. Yeah, I can try. Um, we need to do more research, I think, uh, A. Uh, we had 
one person on the project whose name is Joe Link, who started to do some work around this and was sending us a really great, uh, yeah, pile of articles that we have on our drive and that we need to move through, I think. Um, Icebreaker is a well-tested platform for this kind of work. And so because it had been in use for a while and really prides itself on the ability to make conversations intimate and enjoyable online, we kind of, uh, I guess, capitalized on it or, or utilized it because we knew it worked and I had personal experience with it working as well. Um, yeah, the icebreaker sets you up in this one-on-one -on -one frame with a, a kind of deck of cards and you click and you're able with your partner without another facilitator in the room with you to generate uh, questions that are surprising to you, but you also have agency to be like, nah, I don't wanna answer that question, which I think is really important because in Zoom, we often don't have our own sense of agency. We're put into breakout rooms. There, of course, uh, there's something called the open space framework where you make everybody a host and that kind of opens up the opportunity for folks to choose the breakouts they want, the breakout rooms they want to be in. But that's not the standard way it's utilized. So yeah, I would say Icebreakers is one platform that I was really excited about because it was so much fun. I cried, I laughed. <laughs> I hope audience members did too. What would you say, Todd? Well, I think the first thing you said, Courtney, was the most honest and true is we should do more research on this. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, we, we've continued to do research through this and the overarching civility project on the benefits of civil discourse. But what I regret, if I'm honest about it, is we haven't done enough on, you know, this last year was a big experiment for all of us, but I feel like we probably could have done more systematic data collection on it. Um, you know, I, I think it's hard to replace the, the, but this is my thinking, not my, you know, empirical data in a sort of measured sense. But it's hard, it's really hard. We've learned it's really hard over the last year to, to, to um, have that connection that somehow is there when you're physically in a place with someone. Um, but hopefully we're getting better at it. I sure hope so. Yeah, and I'll say uh, one more thing, which is that the play, the race 2020, this version was done two election cycles in a row. So this was the third election cycle it was being utilized and was opened up for artists and theater makers around the world to utilize and specifically it was mostly done in the United States um, and we were having conversations monthly with Sojourn Theater uh, about this very question what does it mean to bring a play which is all about um, audience engagement uh, figuring out how we be in space with one another and to shift that online and we were having really interesting conversations with theater companies uh, and artists who were doing that work across the country at the same time and, and having all sorts of uh, brain fog about how to make it work digitally. And I'm not sure any of us really figured it out in the end. We all made lots of mistakes, uh, which is part of the process, right? Indeed. There's one. Nope. I wonder if you could talk about what you learned from the race that you'll carry forward into Conversations Cubed. Yeah, so uh, even, even with the two months or so, and Taylor Wood and I were the co-directors on the race, and we had been talking about the project with Todd and Bob throughout the course of the summer, uh, as we expanded the team and had very lofty ideas of well, we don't just want to work with Virginia Tech people. We want to work with a high school in Roanoke County and a community-based theater named Adair Theater uh, in Pulaski. And we want to work with the students in Floyd. We encountered all sorts of internet challenges. For instance, we had this idea working, of working with Mozilla Hubs and this platform Future Stages. But it became very clear that if we were to select that platform, it would ostracize the, the folks that we brought into the projects because it required a level of internet connectivity that they didn't have access to. So weighing the balance, and I think I have a, a little bit of a better sense of the time commitment that this sort of exploration takes, and then also the hard moral choices uh, and ethical choices that I feel really committed to, for instance, uh, working with folks outside of Virginia Tech is still really important to me. And if that means uh, 
choosing a platform that isn't as technologically brilliant uh, in favor of working with those folks, I'm going to choose those people. And the other thing is that we do want to continue those relationships. And so it's likely that we will work with Springhouse Community School again, for instance, uh, folks in Patrick County, the Patrick County Friends for Equity and Justice, and internet con connectivity is hard. I mean, if I can be so bold, and I'm going to get struck by lightning. I'm sure this space has like <laughs> lightning bolt machine in it or something, if I diss technology. But I would say, and, and I'm being a little forward because I didn't really, you know, Courtney and, and Taylor really uh, uh, ran the race uh, with David and other people's uh, obviously uh, incredible work. But um, I wouldn't, I'd say I wouldn't want to let technology get in the way. And I mean, it's funny because we're talking about how can we use all these cool things in here to, but you know, there were times that when the, with the race, the technology broke down and actually kudos, this is a much a compliment in a way is that <laughs> they found a way to continue on despite that. And I think that's actually a good lesson to learn is, is like, you know, if you just let the technology be the thing, then when the technology doesn't work, what do you have left? So I'd want this to still be about the conversation and the technology is there both because we think it can be impactful in a positive way, and frankly, we want to play with it, right? I mean, we're here at a university to play with new things and push it along and see what's possible, um, but that we have to kind of stay centered on the conversation, if I put it that way. If you would introduce yourself, if you would introduce yourself. And that was Patty Ron before. Thank you, Patty. Hi, I'm Jamie McReynolds with the Moss Art Center. Um, I'm curious about the workshops that you did last year and what sort of key takeaways um, do you have from that, those workshops? Yeah, so that's, thank you. It's a, so we've been doing the workshops, so to be transparent, we've been doing versions of them for a couple years. It wasn't just sort of under this project. Um, and I think what we've learned is actually how, um, and I'd be curious, because obviously you have a lot of experience with, with this as well, but um, I think what we've learned is, is that it's actually not that hard to have people who disagree fundamentally. It's not that hard for them to have a good conversation. I think we see so much on TV and so on that you know people who don't agree with one another just scream at each other, and that's kind of the default behavior towards one another. Um, but in fact, it's through all of the workshops we've done, the five last year plus prior workshops, it's actually shocking the other way to me how few times we've had to intervene and say, in fact, I think it's really only once we've had to kind of interrupt the conversation and say, this is not healthy. To the contrary, for the most part, people find ways to relate to one another, they find ways to click, and they consistently, and we do have some data on this through surveys and so on, they consistently leave with a much more um, positive um, uh, perspective on what it's like to have a conversation with someone else. They don't disagree with the other person because they had that conversation. I'll be clear on that. People very rarely change their mind, but they do feel more like humanizing of the other person and, and related, they feel the other person's more relatable and so on. So increases empathy is what we'd say. Coming your way. Sorry to make you walk so far over. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eric Schoenborn. I'm an MFA candidate in Creative Technologies and a GA here at ICAT. And um, I'm interested in the idea of how the audience is giving feedback. You know, when you're talking about doing live performances online, we experienced that a lot over the last year. And there's a lot of people working on these kind of things. I mean, Instagram Live and Twitch are two places where this is, for some people, they prefer that over a live performance because they're growing up with that not being, you know, odd to them. And I think in some ways we're talking about this as like being a bad thing. Um, have you been able to measure people within that space or have you thought about that? Or like how can you get the lessons that they're getting where people are in the moment in those spaces rather than like thinking about it in a Zoom call kind of context? Thank Let's talk. Yeah. yeah, I'd be really curious to explore that. It, uh, Twitch is not a space I find myself in very frequently, uh, but it's been around for a while, right? Uh, so I'd be really interested to, yeah, have a conversation with you. Yeah. What we've been thinking about so far is more in the room audience participation through, so uh, by coincidence, was that this week or last week? I don't know, time just seems to go somewhere. We were talking actually with David uh, for Nusich about, um, you know, if we use something like Mentimeter, is there an API output that can feed into, you know, we're talking about colors as a way to reflect, you know, how do we turn numbers or, or, or where somebody dials, you know, a, a bar, how do we turn that into a visualization? 
Um, we honestly, I think, you know, haven't thought enough yet about, but theoretically that should be just as possible. So if an audience is watching through one of the platforms you mentioned or YouTube Live like we're using today, um, that should be just as possible. In other words, the Mentimeter, you know, if we use Mentimeter as the interface, it's obviously um, place agnostic, right? You could be at home and still contributing into it. So it's, it's hard to be honest with you. I think one question we have, and this is where, again, yeah, I mean, feedback is welcome, is it's really, I'm worried at least about how do we avoid um, trolling, right? I mean, there's one thing when you have people in a space and you have them interact with a Mentimeter or some other um, platform as a way to provide data. Um, it's a whole other thing if you open it up to the wider world. And maybe I'm just too old and curmudgeonly and skeptical of humanity and all those things, but I don't know. No, I don't, I don't think you are, Todd. That's a Zoom bombing, of course we know, and trolling online is a huge thing. And as part of the race, we, I mentioned it very briefly, but we had a series of workshops with different uh, community groups. And the idea originally was that there would be an intentional audience that was able to interact with the performers and that the wider YouTube audience, which was not directly interacting, would be able to view. And it was for that exact reason. We did not want to jeopardize the safety um, of the folks that were watching. And it didn't end up working out because it was technologically very difficult, uh, but it's a, it's a question that I still hold uh, and would want to explore. And I wonder if there's a solution to it now, right? Because we did this uh, a little less than a year ago. So there's definitely more out there. With that, we are at time. Uh, a little, little past, but it's fine. I didn't stop you, so uh, thank you. This work is so powerful, and uh, we love the way that you're, you're taking this technology and taking all of these different pieces to, to really move towards empathy and move towards the, um, uh, you know, use the aesthetics and use the, all the spaces. This is, we love this project. Um, and the work that you're doing is so powerful. So thank you and please keep doing it. Um, and for those of you who are here, thank you so much. We'll hang around for a few minutes. I think there's still a few more donuts. Uh, if you're at home, enjoy whatever's in your pantry. <laughs> and <laughs> um, thank you again. We'll, we'll be back next week. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.